The way I would kind of describe what happens at a summer institute is that you have scientists, but you also have humanistic scholars and contemplative thinkers, and then people in the clinical profession. So there's really a whole range of different types of people here, and it's the exchanges between them that uh, make it so interesting. And, and it's very difficult to filter out all the assumptions of those human cultures. You know, science has done an extraordinary job of mapping the human genome, mapping the cosmos, mapping the earth, but we have really not fully mapped ourselves, our minds, who we are as human beings. And the kinds of benefits that have accrued through this mapping of the universe and the genome and so forth, I think will also accrue to us as we successfully and in diverse ways explore who we are, map the mind itself. That's the reason it's so important for mind and life. Consciousness in which we have wakefulness, where sleep is at the low end, that doesn't, that doesn't really make sense anymore. Any mapping of the mind is going to be a model or a representation that's used for some purpose. Um, and that we'd probably need a lot of those, just like we need lots of different types of maps. You know, one of the very big questions for us to tackle is a map for what purpose? There may be kinds of maps for a particular uh, spiritual practice that look rather different from the map I would have of mind if I'm interested in surgical interventions to uh, relieve epilepsy. Those are all different kinds, of, but all of them involving some kind of map of mind. And at the same time that this was taking place, medicine was beginning to undergo a kind of revolution. With no mental maps, there's no way to relate what it is that we would learn through studying the brain to, uh, to the nature of the mind or the, or the way that the mind functions. And I think it's going to be interesting to try to find um, uh, language that describes something as uh, mysterious and fluid as the nature of consciousness as the nature of attention, as the nature of awareness, of the nature of goodness or kindness. The reason it's so important to do this kind of project of mapping the mind is that we want to know how we should live. And, you know, it might be that mapping the mind can actually help us answer that question in important ways. Empirically, you could find that, you know, you fix one little molecule in the ventral striatum and it's still, to me, the fundamental mystery um, how the brain and consciousness are related. The, the knee-jerk response you'll get among mainstream neuroscientists is that consciousness arises out of the brain. Well, that doesn't really explain anything, and even if it's true, which it may or may not be, but if it's true, how, how does that work? That the ability of neural systems to influence each other in the brain there is a huge, always a big gap between an aspiration and our actual behavior and, and action. And that has to do with motivation. And why is it that we are not able to sustain motivation? And why is it so effortful? And I think this is one area where uh, I would like to see science come up with a, a better understanding of the mechanisms. <laughs> We as human beings are often bonded by a common experience. And we can reach through our differences to a place that is characterized by a great sense of uh, ethical concern, uh, by uh, fundamental uh, altruism and kindness, um, and by a sense of discovery that we all share. We want to know, you know who we really are. And at some level, we're each other.